are these people? Who are these people? Who are these people? Now I need to go slideshow on. All right. All right. These are our quick hits. So these are short articles. I didn't clip the whole thing, but I thought that there was something significant in each one of them that I hadn't really seen talked about anywhere else, but I want to talk about it here. So first, coming out of FreightWaves.com, which is a, a pretty good freight supply chain kind of industry rag a little on the mainstreamy side again you got to decipher where people are at and 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 read between the lines of what they say but this is pretty big a 462 million dollar verdict against a trucking company how big is the trucking company Jesus. i mean pretty good size depending well they yeah. think that this will probably end up bankrupting you know the, this organization and who ends up hurt by all of that? I mean, it's, I understand, but look at this. The jury, this was from 2019. They drive basically under the back of the truck, two cars, two people were killed in two different things. So they sued the truck trailer manufacturer, right? And Wabash National is evaluating its options in response to a $462 million verdict against the truck trailer manufacturer by a jury in Missouri State Court. You know, this is the way you bankrupt capitalism. You hold them accountable for the injuries. All right. St. Louis jury reached a verdict, $450 million in punitive damages, and $6 million each to the families of the two victims. Okay. $450 million. I can't even imagine what the people who like were at the trucking company were feeling, you know, and there's a lot in this article about like that. They're claiming, look, they, there's nothing that could have been done differently. It says that it could have major implications for the trucking industry, which has resisted regulations to require impact guard equipment that prevents cars from sliding underneath. Like today, the same thing would happen has happened in 2019. So <clears throat> maybe something like this will get them to do that. So I thought, like, wow, that that's a lot of money. You don't see that every day. Now, yeah. speaking of a lot of money, I like this publication. Again, kind of shit Libby at times, but very good at chasing the money. Inequality.org. And there's they have an, a writer there by the name of Sam Pizzigatti. We've definitely covered an article of his or two on the show before. He wrote something about private equity entering the NFL. We don't normally cover this kind of stuff, but I thought it was interesting and worth bringing to a quick hit that the billionaires who run the world's most phenomenally profitable sport have just decided to share the wealth with the greediest of their fellow rich by a 31 to 1 margin. And we're going to talk about who the 30, who the one is. The owners of the 32 pro football franchises that make up the NFL have just voted to crack open their money-making machine to the investment fund kingpins of private equity. These fucking parasites get everywhere. You greedy dirtbag! The NFL isn't exactly welcoming in private equity with, with, with totally open arms. Only some NFL pre-approved private equity firms will even be initially able to buy up stakes in NFL franchises. And they're going to limit and allow no single private equity stake to amount to over 10% of a franchise's total value. So part of the reason for this and uh, is because the values of the franchises are becoming so high that the families that own them don't want to hold all of the liability and want, as the thing grows, they need the marketing support and the alignment with these private equity firms. And you're going to see private equity industry has over time been generating plenty of windfalls like these for decades. Now they've been buying up firms, charging them enormous fees and stripping them of their assets. Like they did with Toys R Us and Sears and so many. Right. They, now what they, what he talks about in this article, two things was um, one Bolero, oh. which is now like the largest bowling center um, in the country, right? Yeah. Um, and how Bolero, let me go back here, 
Polero, um, now there are 350 other nationwide. They're starting to raise their prices and they're putting all the local guys out and they're becoming the only game in town. And the, the one, by the way, is the Green Bay Packers, which is a publicly owned, not-for-profit, not-for-profit company, publicly traded. Old cheesy boys. And no one person can mm. own more than a, than a couple of thousand shares out of this massive 154,000 share pool to keep it truly right. public. And then what happened was after they did that in the 60s, the NFL actually passed a law that no no franchise could ever do that again. Okay. It's like it, communism in a way, you know, like everybody has a stake, everybody owns it, everybody has a say, and they right. NFL shut that down. Now, have the pay Packers made any less money than all the other franchises because of that? No. It's perfectly would have been acceptable. Plus, the people who live in the city can have state more actual stake. Um, so yeah, the Bolero thing was interesting, and that the one vote against the private equity was the the Packers, uh, because they were publicly traded and publicly owned, and the people had a say. All the other ones were, right. you know, billionaire owners. And the uh, the Cowboys now I saw is worth somewhere close to ten billion dollars. Right. Um, yeah, here, Roger Meadows saying Steelers and Packers are cooperatively owned by their fans. Will that change? I don't know. I thought that that the Steel that the the, the Packers uh, the Steelers were owned by uh, a family. I thought maybe not. Um, <clears throat> all right. Anyway, getting back to my quick hits here. Um, the next one I could have done a whole story about this, and I have three slides about it because I think there's a ton there. And I really want people to go check this out, all right? And this is um, over at inequality.org. Um, I think that's where, where I found No, at otherwords, otherwords.com. Sarah Anderson, uh, the big rip. This is about low-wage corporations, the 100 largest corporations that pay low wages, minimum wage stuff, spent half a trillion dollars inflating CEO pay how with stock buybacks. We've talked about stock buybacks before and how parasitic they are, but mm -hmm. this kind of money, again, half a billion dollars over here yeah, in 30 years. And this is, again, I, I looked at this. This is since 2020, uh, in the last five years, this research yeah. is. All right. So why are lower low wage workers better paid? It's not because employers don't have cash. It's because profitable corporations spend that money on their stock prices and CEOs instead. And you can see mm -hmm. some numbers about that. All right. Lowe's ranks as an extreme example, but pumping up CEO pay at the expense of workers and long-term investment is actually the norm among America's low-wage leading corporations. So she writes this whole website called Executive Excess Report for the Institute for Policy Studies. I'll, I'll link all of this stuff in the chat in, in the uh, in the description afterwards. All right. She found that the top one that the one hundred S and P five hundred firms with the lowest median wages or the low wage one hundred blew again five hundred twenty two billion not million five hundred twenty two billion dollars on buybacks over the. Over the past five years, I mean, it's that's a that's a stunningly ridiculously large number. Now, yeah, this was about that. Not only was was her report about that, but also about CEO pay. But pulling out the ones about buybacks, all right. Again, the the company spent forty two billion lows, all right, just on buying back its own shares, which just inflates their own stock price and helps their shareholders and doesn't do anything to reinvest the money in the company, which is what that money, billions of dollars is designed and, and they're, they've been gouging and pulling out of their employees' pockets anyway, plus the profits they've made from the goods that they've sold, which is very minimal. Mostly it's off the labor. All right. So Marvin Ellison, $18 million, which still, compared to a $42 billion buyback, that seems like a pretty good deal. 
I I guess, but it's yeah. a bad deal for everybody else. Their median annual worker thirty two thousand dollars, and a lot of them are part timers. Home Depot, same what, same thing. Big box chains, right? All right. So, but the CEO one is insane. It went from six hundred and three to one down to five thirty eight to one. Like, yeah. thanks. All right. Ross stores had the largest gap. I mean, you, you know, everybody, anyone who's ever walked into a Ross stores gets that. All right. He's that's one, the that's the one from Friends, right? They were on a break, mm -hmm. weren't they on a break? <laughs> I think they were on a break. All right. 20, sure. 2100 times as much as the $8,600 pay that went to her median compensated employee, a part time associate. Wow. Oh, good old John Donahoe. Yep. Good old Donahoe. 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 All right. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So. That was a crazy report. Again, the big rip, low-wage corporations spending half a trillion dollars inflating their CEO pay Jesus, because they're manipulating their stock price by artificially buying it back. And by the way, it used to be illegal until the 80s to do this entirely. Yeah. So. But greed I, is good, so, you right? know, it should be fine. Right. So. Kit Clarenberg, we all know him. He's an Indie Media Award honoree. I got a sound coming out somewhere. There it is. All right. He published this, I think it was this morning, or maybe it was, he published it the other day, but he shared it this morning and I caught it and I'm like, I made an audible and I'm like, we got to share it. We got to put something about this in. And that's when I decided to make a slideshow and only pull out a couple paragraphs. Go read this over at Global Delinquents. That's just at kitclarenberg.com. You have to type the www. If you don't, it doesn't always redirect you, depending on your browser. And all my Adeen investigation, he's talking about the, the collapsing empire and how the U.S. aircraft carriers are now dead in the water and they are vulnerable. Yes. And yes, and our carrier fleet is not nearly as powerful as it is being sold on TV. What? Huh? A new world order awaits. Hmm. Something like that. Bad Mads, yeah. welcome to the stream. All right. An Al Mayadeen investigation from July 19th laid bare the Navy's crushing defeat by Ansar Allah in Washington's initially vaunted Operation Prosperity Guardian. All right. That's where they sent all these ships to the Middle East. Western media has finally acknowledged the empire's comprehensive Empire. trouncing, comprehensive trouncing by God's partisans, in an epic David versus Goliath triumph. Where have I, where have I heard that framing before? But we've heard that one a few times. Yeah. Elsewhere, too. Yep. Reporting on the much hyped USS Eisenhower aircraft carrier strike groups returned to base after months of. Relentless bombardment by the resistance amply underlines how aircraft carriers, the core component of U.S. hegemony for decades, are quite literally dead in the water. Wait. I really have not heard very much about this part of it, honestly. So I'm like, wait, what? what? He, he goes into a bunch of stuff about how there was a naval exercise back in the in the early 2000s that the Chinese, you know, they basically simulated going to war with the Chinese over the Taiwan Strait, sending a carrier group China. there. And they said that within two weeks in the simulation, all the soldiers had been killed and all the, and all the carrier group had been sunk. And so they mm -hmm. started rigging the war game and restricting and limiting the exercise so that the U.S. would would win the war game in the end um, and not actually defending that policy from that point. Um, not apparently, to be confused with War Games, the movie. No. Completely different thing. Yes. Um, so <clears throat> its conclusion is that to draw from uh, Operation Prosperity Guardian is that aircraft carriers have been proven beyond any reasonable doubt to be a redundant relic of a bygone unipolar age. Yeah. The, the Empire's bloated, exorbitantly expensive military machine built in recent decades, exclusively suited to one-sided gang beatings of adversaries that can't retaliate, 
is now unable to meet the challenges of modern warfare. <clears throat> By contrast, the Resistance have effortlessly innovated and equipped themselves for the 21st century battle and been a lot more economical about it. Yeah, so, that's the important bit. <clears throat> I mean, how much they take out, you know, what it costs them to take out a a carrier, you know? Um, well, and a lot of these are like retrofitted stuff. They're old equipment with band-aids put on it just to keep them floating like you know it's it's just the general paper tiger effect that the u.s military has now become you know it's essentially north of grumming and raytheon and loads of military contractors upselling their equipment for i don't know six seven decades now but we're right? 900 so, are we buying new aircraft carriers because we're giving them 900 billion dollars a year already to the yep. military? I mean, yeah, we've got to fund yeah. all the and salaries and all the bases and all the I mean, there's not that much honestly left over sadly when you lay all well, that money out for all that war, other stuff plus the wars. War doesn't happen on the open sea anymore. Like that's part of the problem is that it takes place in localized areas you know where you could nine million more on drone equipment is going to do you way better than one aircraft carrier so you know i mean it's also for us we have aircraft bases anywhere in the world we don't really need them that's part of it you know it used to be you needed it because we needed fuel requirement in the pacific you know? well, it's it's actually no it's like, more than it's re it's mobile reinforcements is what you have yeah where you can effectively set yeah. up a city in a uh, you know city at sea mm -hmm. outside to further intimidate yeah and and make happen what you're and you throw to make a couple happen. of battleships next to it bombard it from the you know but like that's not how things work anymore so you yeah. know they don't they don't necessarily mind all that yeah but yeah I mean. Yeah, Sternberg's on it. It's so, essentially outdated equipment. Yep. Check out act. Uh, check um, out uh, both active measures, but that one is global delinquents. That's that's Kit's personal Substack himself, his website. Um, on a positive, happy, good note. <laughs> this is mm. a good story. All right. John Pilger's son. I, I noticed recently that the johnpilger.com website was down. And I was like, God damn, man. Like, it would be a real shame if all of his work somehow ended up lost because people couldn't, nobody wanted to maintain a website or whatever. And I had yeah. noticed it. I think I had actually sent a link to somebody and be like, hey, did you notice that this was down? And sure enough, damn, his son launched with the help of Mark Curtis from Declassified UK a new version of johnpilger.com celebrating his life career free access to 64 of his films i mean nice you know um now mark wrote this article and it doesn't really it, it's a little small but i wanted to read this it's two slides um and this is kind of the first story into what the first real story i wanted to get to a giant of journalism, all right, uh, was how Britain's National Union of Journalists described John Pilger on his death in December 2023. It's a, it, that's clear, you know, it's, and a giant he was, a brave and prolific filmmaker and a brilliant reporter with a rare gift for vivid descriptive writing. But his greatest gift for, perhaps was in lifting rocks. In his dozens of documentaries and hundreds of articles over six decades, most often exposing the ruthlessness of power, John became the most important journalist of his generation. That's a bold statement. And I, in a lot of ways, it's hard to, hard to disagree with. Um, you know, he... Trailblazer. Another, by the way, everyone here, Mark Curtis and John Pilger, Indie Media Award honorees, of course. But... I don't hear that. I don't know what happened there. You didn't? No. But I heard that. That I heard. I pressed, I pressed the button. From yeah. Vietnam to South Africa, Cambodia to Palestine, John's work was committed to holding governments, especially the US, Britain, and Australia, 
too often absolved of criminality in the West to account for their actions and abuses. This is what true journalism should be about, but as John knew only too well, rarely is. Hence the Indie Media Awards. He spoke, mm -hmm. out, he spoke out in support of the vulnerable and marginalized, those in poverty, asylum seekers, victims of war, and indigenous citizens in countries where they were often seen as unpeople. For years, he advocated for his friend Julian Assange, persecuted by a rapacious U.S. empire for telling the truth and the touchstone in our era dividing those who commit or defend war crimes for those who expose them. John's films brought global attention to neglected issues. After his 1994 film Death of a Nation, about Indonesia's brutal occupation of East Timor was screened in Britain, it became the highest rated TV documentary in 15 years with 4,000 telephone calls per minute made by viewers to the program's action line. The film had been crucial, said Timor's first president, Jose Ramos Horta, after his country gained its independence in bringing forward our liberation and saving countless lives. John's books and articles along with his television and cinema films, forensically documented many of the worst crimes of the 20th century, drawing on his first-hand reporting in places such as Vietnam, Cambodia, Biafra, and Bangladesh. He traveled the world. And his experiences from reporting on the impoverished north of England in the 1960s to the civil rights movement in the USA and the genocide of Pol Pot's Khmer Rouge shaped his lifelong commitment to justice. John was a campaigning journalist in the best sense of that phrase. He cared about people, the people he wrote about and worked throughout his career to encourage them, tell their stories, and make the world a better place. Shouldn't we all? The great legacy he leaves. When this relaunched and improved website showcases, which this relaunched and improved website showcases, is not just that of historical interest, it's a vital guide to the world we find ourselves in now and a signal to all that with determination and courage, we as individuals together and as, if, and as individuals can throw light on what's wrong and help to change it. That's kind of what we try to do. I mean... So, this is a debut. I think we might have shown one when we did Gastola, but I thought it was quite appropriate that um, that we launch uh, the kind of what the template's going to look like for all of the honorees around John Pilger, who is kind of a godfather to all of this independent media. Um, so, I'm... One of... You know, um, um, humbled at how great Zago made that. I mean, so we made a deal with with a uh, an artist, an illustrative artist, to have had you know uh, illustrations of all the Indie Media Award honorees, as well as all the logos for uh, most of the logos for the the uh, the the organizations. And this one came out amazing. Um, some of these people contributed directly and. We really appreciate that. Uh, there are a bunch of ways to do it. That QR code up there, co-fee.com slash Indie News Network is another way to do it. Um, the, uh, yeah, Cash App, Dollar Sign Indies, Indie News Network. John H. hooked us up a couple times this week. Really thank you for that. Substack, a couple people subscribed on Substack. We're now sub uh, doing a daily newsletter at innnewsletter.com as well as at indiemediatoday.com. I've got two different newsletters going. So we're we're busy as hell, man, and and we're doing all this and we love doing it and we want to keep doing it. And the more support we get, the more we can keep doing and the more help we can get. Um again, uh Dave Burt, RIP John Pilger, Heidi Pilger was a hero. Yes. When is the next Indie Media Awards? Um the plan is for the sometime in late October. We've been working on that. Um, 
I've been working on it for um, over a month, obviously, with, with Lucio. I have the list, kind of preliminary list of the 2024 honorees that I want to add to, to the, the next class, basically. Um, and then, you know, we've got all the imagery done, and then we just got to make a live stream and set it all up. So that's going to be soon. By all means, um, love doing that. Uh, you know, honoring all the best in independent media. You can go to indiemediaawards.substack.com now, or just indiemediaawards.com. There's a link tree there; it'll take you to the Substack, and there are links and pages for each honoree and each outlet. Shanda, by the way, is also an Indie Media Award honoree, as is Oz. We've got yep, lots of them happening around here. Um, that's who we like to feature is the best of the best and and the independents that are true to what we you know to what we do and and that, that speak the truth all right so let me get out of the slideshow now now that we're done with that one i actually did want to show you the website of johnpilger.com not just the article from mark but here we go all right so this is johnpilger.com. It's like a WordPress blog site that has all of his articles, including his his last one. We are we are Spartacus, are we? Right. I believe that was his yep. last article before he passed away. Which right. we read on Ina News. I believe so you, you can did. go check that. You can go check that out. How cool is that? Um you've got some of the the tweets about him from Counterpunch, and here's where you can watch the videos. And Palestine is still the issue, and all by category, and just yeah, we might do one of those for um content for like days. A, a movie movie night over on the over on the Rumbles. Content for um, days. Content for days. That's uh, that's about what I. Hey, how about that? That wrapped up pretty nicely, but. Support independent media, like I said, support INN, support the Zago Brothers, independent art as well. They are independent. We're independent. It just kind of works, you know, independence helping each other. And and this is nobody else is going to do this for us. They got billions. We got us. And we got yep. you. So thank <clears throat> you. Really. I love you all.